Good morning. Thank you so much for having us here today. My name is Jennifer Bain. I am a child neurologist um, from Columbia University, um, and I am affiliated with Columbia University Division of Child Neurology, as well as the Columbia University Weinberg Family Cerebral Palsy Center. And I'm here with my co-host. Hi, thank you. I'm uh, Jacqueline Montez. I am a physical therapist also at Columbia. I'm fortunate to be able to work with Dr. Bain. I am in the uh, Department of Rehabilitation and Regenerative Medicine and in the uh, programs in physical therapy. So thank you for having me. So today we'll uh, cover the following topics, um, approach to management in CAND, types of movement disorders, cerebral palsy at, versus CAND, and then discuss some options for uh, treatment of spasticity, including medications, surgeries, and therapies. First, we wanted to talk about the approach to management. And really one of the terms we're gonna start with is a movement disorder. And what exactly is a movement disorder? Most people have actually these generalized movement disorders, which have abnormal movements that really aren't there in a, in a typical person who is typically developing. And they really can cause um, problems in specific areas of the body, but also really affect the, the body as a whole in your everyday function. For us, it's really important to identify what exactly is that specific movement that's abnormal and how does that movement impair the function for that individual? Every patient is different and we need to identify what matters to that patient, how that movement affects that patient, and what is the goal of potentially treating that movement. What we'll be talking about today is really some of the treatments that are there to alleviate generalized as well as focal spasticity, as well as a new term called dystonia, as well as treatment for focal areas of dysfunction. We really want to be able to provide um, a greater understanding for spasticity, but also some of the other movements that might come along with spasticity in the group. And most importantly, we think it's quite important to discuss this as a multidisciplinary approach. And so as a child neurologist, um, I never am acting alone. I'm thinking about other care providers, such as physical therapists, rehabilitation providers, as well as orthopedic surgeons. Ideally, you really want to have a team-based approach, whether that's in a physical location of a center or just having the ability for different providers to discuss your case as a whole. It's so important to think about the collaboration between different providers, um, as well as those people in your, your, your medical field, as well as at your, at your school um, or whatever community supports you have. And so one of the big disclaimers to today's discussion is that I am a neurologist and, and Jackie is one of our physical therapists, um, but we're not really hearing from other providers providers in the field, such as orthopedic surgeons, rehabilitation doctors, as well as other therapists. So I think it's really important to remember that this is just based on our experience, our experience with the CAN community, um, and our experience with other patients with cerebral palsy and other uh, neurological and movement disorders. A CP center or a cerebral palsy center can be helpful in providing some of these multidisciplinary approach. However, this is certainly not needed or required for everybody here today. And shortly we'll be talking about what is cerebral palsy and what is CANNED. Um, and so it might actually not necessarily be the appropriate center um, for CANNED, but it might provide that multidisciplinary approach that we're really aiming for. We're going to start with what is spasticity, and, and that's because CAND asked us to come and, and chat with you guys about spasticity as a big concern. In general, spasticity is increased tone. So what is tone? Tone is your muscle at rest. Tone is the passive or kind of resting state of your muscles. It allows us to keep posture, whether you have a good posture or a poor posture. And really, that's different than strength. Strength is your muscle in motion. So again, tone is resting muscle and strength is movement or, or strength of your muscle. And so spasticity is when your resting tone is increased or high or tight. And so some of the terms you might hear are hypertonia or spasticity or increased tone. And some people might just say tightness. It really is dependent sometimes on how that body part is movement. So is being moved passively. And so if you take somebody's arm, for example, and you move it slowly, you might actually not feel any tightness. 
However, if you do move it more quickly, you might feel that tightness a little bit more. Spasticity can lead to unwanted posturing. It can lead to muscle tightening. And importantly, it can lead to contractures where you actually have tightening of those joints and that soft tissue, um, for example, in the knees, the ankles, um, the arms and the wrists. Um, and those can certainly be problematic for many reasons. Sometimes spasticity, however, can be helpful because it actually can provide some strength or some stability, almost like a crutch or an assistive device um, when the muscle itself is weak. Now, importantly, we were asked to come and speak about spasticity. However, we thought it would be really important to mention a couple other abnormal movements that might be also um, seen in your family members. For example, dystonia. This is another type of involuntary movement where it actually leads to un unwanted posturing, sometimes twisting of particular body parts. It can be seen in single body parts called focal, or it can kind of be seen in the whole body called generalized. This typically happens when you're attempting to move. So when you're doing different activities, you start having new abnormal postures or movements. Here are some just resting pictures of people with these unwanted postures. Importantly, dystonia can only be diagnosed during a physical examination. And so a picture alone will not be able to diagnose dystonia. You need to be able to see a provider in person to appropriately diagnose and assess for dystonia as well as spasticity. Dystonia does relax during sleep. It does not lead to contractures as opposed to the spasticity that will lead to contractures. It's not uncommon to see spasticity and dystonia together. And it's really important to, to think about um, how each of these may be contributing to um, the presentation of, of your loved one. Another term that we want to just throw out there is called chorea and athetosis or chorea athetosis. These are also abnormal movements. They're extra movements. They are involuntary, so they're not on purpose. And it can actually look like restlessness, a person who has a little bit of movements. Korea means dance in Latin or Koreas. And these are brief kind of jerky movements, whereas athetosis is more snake-like. Um, so typically we think of Korea and athetosis as extra movements that normally are not there. Um, and these can also be seen in individuals with cerebral palsy. We have not seen too much of this with canned, but we certainly haven't seen everybody with canned. Ataxia is a generalized term for incoordination. It can sometimes be seen with clumsy walking, slurred speech, and this typically is attributed to problems with a part of the brain called the cerebellum. Importantly, all of those types of movement disorders that we just mentioned, spasticity, dystonia, chorea, apoptosis, and ataxia, now, these aren't dangerous to the brain as something like a seizure, where you have abnormal electrical activity that actually is damaging the brain, but they certainly can have complications and impact on the everyday life of that individual. They can limit their functional ability of doing regular everyday things, such as walking, eating, cleaning, typing, writing. And they actually really increase their energy expenditure of that individual. So it leads to significant weight loss in some people because there may be limit them from um, being able to feed themselves effectively. They might not be able to swallow and eat as much as they should be. It might lead to difficulty swallowing in addition to just having a higher energy expenditure in general. With spasticity specifically, this actually can cause tightening or shortening of soft tissue and lead to contractures, which leads to more difficulty in, in their functional ability, as well as pain. Many of these movement disorders are associated with pain, and they certainly can lead to many different injuries, fractures, dislocations, cuts, bruises, stitches, and many visits to the emergency room. We're going to shift gears a little bit. We were talking about the movement disorder, which are the actual movements. I want to shift to what is cerebral palsy. People might have been given this diagnosis when they were younger or older. In general, it is a term that we use to, to imply a motor disturbance. Again, motor muscle only. It is a motor disturbance causing abnormal or delayed movement, posture, and or tone. Typically, in the past, we used to think of this as injury to the developing brain or an alteration to the developing brain. So meaning presentation is when children are young, so less than three years of age. 
Importantly, especially for the audience today, cerebral palsy is typically attributed to a non-progressive static injury, and it does lead to impaired function. And on the bottom right is, a, is just a, a, a picture of some of the ways that we describe um, when somebody has injury to the brain, which is the, the small pictures on the top, and what that can lead to in terms of types or pictures of cerebral palsy. Sometimes people have weakness on one side of the body called hemiplegia. Sometimes they have weakness specifically in the legs called diplegia. If all four extremities are involved, we call that quadriplegia. People who have those abnormal movements like athetosis, sometimes we call that athetoid. Dystonic would be those abnormal dystonic posturing. And then ataxic would be um, unsteadiness in the walking. However, the question for us today also is, well, is canned really cerebral palsy? Now, some people in the audience very likely have gotten diagnosed or have had a diagnosis of cerebral palsy. In general, while we're not 100% sure for everybody, we certainly haven't met everybody, we're not really sure cerebral palsy is the appropriate uh, diagnosis or diagnostic term for canned. And why is that the case? Well, CP is traditionally used to identify or to describe a condition, a motor condition that's static again, non-progressive. However, CAN, from what we've learned over the last decade, is that it is a progressive disorder. It seems to get worse as an individual does get older. And so in general, we're not sure if using CP really is the correct term in, the, in most cases of CAN, um, but it certainly is a discussion point because of many other reasons, such as CP providing um, more supports in your community, as well as more of that multidisciplinary care. So importantly, we're going to be talking about treatment of spasticity. And importantly, most of this is based on literature and studies that are on cerebral palsy as a group, not on CAND. And so we're going to base our discussion on spasticity from CP studies, not from CAN studies, but hopefully in the years to come, we'll really be able to tease apart um, CAN specific treatment. And so going back to those movement disorders, again, spasticity, dystonia. What do we need to really do? Do we really need to treat it? Again, it's not like a seizure. It's not necessarily damaging to the brain. But if those movements are affecting the quality of life, then we absolutely should consider treating it and talking to your provider about treating it and what to treat. So we need to identify what is the correct movement disorder we're trying to treat. What are the physical therapy um, implications in terms of providing them support? Are there potentially medications that are oral that could be helpful to treating these movement disorders? And then there are specific procedures or, or, or surgeries that could be helpful um, in terms of treating these movement disorders. And for each of these, which we'll go through briefly, we need to know what they can do, what they can't do, and what the risks or potential side effects for each of them are. Again, this was a uh, this is a CP study. This is not a CAN study, but there was a very nice review article um, about a decade ago now, and this is for cerebral palsy patients. In the middle, we're looking at the, how do we treat spasticity. On the right, we're looking at the management of dystonia. And on the left, it describes exactly what does this mean. So if it's green and if it's up high, that means it probably is helpful in managing these problems. If it's on the bottom, it's probably harmful. Red means let's try not to go towards it. It's probably not a helpful thing. And in the middle, well, we're not really sure whether that's helpful or not. So for example, uh, um, for spasticity management, which is in the middle, what we realize is that it is safe and it is effective to use Botox, to use oral medication such as diazepam. And there are surgical procedures such as the dorsal rhizotomy, SCR, that we'll talk about, that, that are shown to be very effective for spasticity. In the middle, however, we probably would recommend other medications as well as other procedures. And then as we move down, there's not as much strong evidence. Again, there might not be necessarily harm involved, but it may not necessarily be super helpful. And then on the right, for dystonia management, Really, Botox is, is the treatment of choice in terms of um, providing support for dystonia because it's very targeted. Um, however, a procedure called deep brain stimulation that we'll mention briefly 
perhaps could be something helpful in the future. Again, this is a decade old and it also is based on CP studies, um, but I think in years to come, we'll start to understand more about how um, these movement disorders are, are presenting in CANT. This is a very long list of oral medications that can be used to treat different movement disorders. And these are often used for combinations of movement disorders. For example, spasticity, dystonia, and a dyskinesia is an abnormal movement, such as those chorea or those athetoid movements. And so uh, very often, many of these medications can be used for multiple types of movement disorders. I'm gonna go through just a few of them very briefly. Benzodiazepines, this is very commonly used in the group. These are medications called, such as clonazepam or clonopin or diazepam or valium. These are just two examples of benzodiazepines. These work by enhancing or increasing a certain neurotransmitter or brain chemical called GABA. And that can be very helpful for treating both dystonia, spasticity, and some of those abnormal movements that we saw. Some of the potential side effects to these groups of medications include sedation, confusion, perhaps some depression, meaning being um, not as awake as typical. And, and your, your brain actually can um, get used to it and become dependent. And so you might have to use higher medications the, the longer you use it. Baclofen is another medication that also targets the GABA receptor, um, a different GABA, GABA B. Um, and this can be very helpful, again, for treating dystonia as well as spasticity. Some of the similar um, side effects of this could be worsening chorea or those movements sometimes. Um, it actually can lead to sedation, incontinence, dizziness, dry mouth, as well as an increased blood glucose. And we do watch closely if there is a um, history of seizures as well when using this medication. Shifting gears a bit, some individuals who might have more of a dystonia pattern as opposed to spasticity might use a medication called levodopa or cinnamon. And this actually um, gives us more of a neurotransmitter, a different neurotransmitter called dopamine. Side effects for levodopa can include nausea, hypotension or low blood pressure, as well as constipation. Trihexphenyl or artine can often be used to treat dystonia as well, but this is an anticholinergic medication, meaning it blocks the acetylcholine muscarinic receptor, and that can actually lead to some many side effects as well, including drowsiness, confusion, memory problems, blurred vision, urinary retention, um, worsening chorea, as well as um, some not so great side effects like um, hallucinations. Any of these medications really can have significant side effects, so you need to work very closely with your provider. Tetrabenazine, as well as some of the newer formulations such as valbenazine and dutetrabenazine, these can be used to treat dystonia as well as abnormal movements like chorea athetosis. Some of the side effects to these medications that actually hit not a specific neurotransmitter, but many neurotransmitters can lead to drowsiness, um, slow movements or Parkinsonism, depression, insomnia, anxiety, and as well as akathisia, meaning kind of constantly moving. I'm gonna shift gears a little bit to more of a procedure. There's lots of medications as we mentioned before, but Botox is certainly something that's used very often in this group as well as individuals with cerebral palsy. Botulinum toxin is a neurotoxin that's produced by actually a bacteria called Clostridium botulinum. And what this does is it actually blocks the communication between the nerve. Here on the right is a picture of a nerve and on the bottom is the muscle. It blocks that communication. And so normally you have acetylcholine, which is a, a chemical that's released from the nerve on the top and it goes down to the muscle on the bottom and it allows that to move and to tell my muscle from the nerve, time to move, time to do things. And what Botox does, it actually blocks that communication and stops it from working. We can use it in small doses to treat spasticity as well as dystonia. And it can be used by different providers. So some people might be receiving it from rehabilitation doctors or physiatrists. Some neurologists are trained in using this as well as orthopedic surgeons. So different providers are able to use Botox. 
the benefit is really a, a, the, the result of using good muscle targeting and dosing. And so it is really a trial and error in that, that that provider will assess you very closely and identify which are the target muscles that we think would be most important to kind of block that communication. And then starting with a low dose and going to a higher dose, what is the amount of medication we need to use to effectively turn off that connection? It does take a few days to take effect when you have botulinum or Botox, and it does only last about three months, more or less, depending on the individual. It can be used to treat spasticity. It can be also used to treat dystonia. Um, and while it does have a wide variety of indications in adults, it's really only approved for children using um, calf or gastrocnemius um, spasticity. It's really used off-label for all the other indications. That being said, it's very commonly used in both adults and children. In some individuals, they also use the Botox along with alcohol, such as ethanol. Importantly, when you're doing this, you actually are turning off the ability to use that muscle. And so if there's any kind of strength or, or, or stability that you're using in that spasticity, you actually might see a little bit of weakness before, before it gets better. Um, so it's just important to recognize and not be worried if you do see a little bit of kind of weakening or, or worsening in the strength before things do get better. The goal of the treatment of using Botox, again, this is in cerebral palsy, is to improve function minimize and prevent contractures because those contractures or tightness can be due to spasticity as well as alleviate any pain. The success really is dependent on using the right amount of medication as well as targeting the correct muscles. Short-term side effects can include bleeding, bruising, a local infection, as well as, as mentioned, a little bit of weakness for a short amount of time. And in the long term, we're really not sure whether or not this um, can lead to muscle atrophy. And so sometimes providers might be reluctant to utilizing it as it might um, actually tell that, that muscle that it's not too useful and maybe we shouldn't be keeping it um, as sturdy. And therefore, you might have muscle loss or muscle atrophy when you lose it, use it for a long time. Lastly, I'm going to discuss a few of the surgical options. Now, importantly, these are all procedures. They are all done um, with, with a, a lot of mindfulness in, in, in for each of them. An intrathecal baclofen pump. Now, this is similar to the medication that you take orally for baclofen. Um, but when you take medications such as baclofen orally, it really does have systemic effects. And so all those side effects that we mentioned with dizziness and, and dry mouth and, and potentially other, other problems systemically, the use of the intrathecal baclofen is really to target the, the, the nerves and, and the, the muscle kind of directly from coming off of the spinal cord. And so this is really helpful for spasticity with fewer of the side effects um, in terms of generalized side effects. We typically will use it um, with lower doses to, to avoid those systemic side effects that we see with the oral baclofen. And it does provide a continuous delivery of medication. Again, most of the studies we're talking about here have intrathecal baclofen and cerebral palsy. And it does show improved tone and quality of life, as well as improvement in gait. However, we have to be mindful this is for cerebral palsy, this is not for CAMD. We have to watch out if an individual does have had sensitivity to, to baclofen before, this might not be the correct um, treatment for them. If they're small and we're not able to physically put that pump into the person because they're, they're small body habitus, we might not be able to utilize it. Um, and if you're not able to access that clinic very closely um, or there's concerns about being able to follow up regularly, it might be difficult to utilize this treatment. And there are potential complications such as infection, that should be wound dehiscence, meaning kind of leakage from that wound itself, leaks from the spinal fluid, clogs in the catheter. And if you actually stop or have a problem with the baclofen pump, it actually can be pretty life-threatening life when you withdraw from it. And so you really need to be able to access that, that center closely. A selective dorsal rhizotomy. Now, when we have spasticity, you have input from the sensory from the outside, and then we have the output out to the muscle. You have two groups of nerves, the in and the out. A selective dorsal rhizotomy will go in and actually cut off some of those sensory inputs. What that does is it tells our, our, our spinal cord and our nerves, let's just slow down. We don't have to be so tight here. And so what the, the surgeon will do, will go in and actually cut off the back of some of these nerves, as you can see here. And they will go in and, and choose the exact ones that seem to be problematic, 
cut them off and allow that spasticity to release. This is primarily utilized for lower body extremity um, spasticity. This is a permanent solution. All right. So, you know, the decision to do a selective dorsal rhizotomy really should be taken under careful consideration, very likely from a multidisciplinary team approach, um, because it is permanent and, and it really can have long term side effects. The last thing I want to just briefly mention is that the use of deep brain stimulation sounds scary for most people. However, this actually is a surgery that you could modulate and turn on and turn off. And so for people with dystonia and other abnormal movements, DBS or deep brain stimulation actually can be quite helpful. And there's a lot of clinical trials that might be up and coming um, to really seeing whether or not this is helpful for abnormal movements. It's used to treat refractory dystonia, not spasticity. Um, and the, the results at this point are not, um, they are mixed, um, but again, um, because it's not as permanent and we can turn things on and off with the neuromodulator, it might be a little um, more targeted and we might be able to really identify specific targets in the, in the brain that, that um, really need to see more, more benefit than others. However, just like any surgeries, you can have infection, you can have bleeding, the hardware itself can malfunction, um, and you really need to make sure that you're, you're working with a team that has good experience with deep brain stimulation. Um, but again, this is in cerebral palsy, not necessarily in CAN. I'm going to pass off to Jackie. Thanks, Jen. So there are several orthopedic interventions that um, um, can be used in combination with some of these treatments um, to alleviate some of the musculoskeletal consequences um, of these movement disorders. Um, first and, and foremost, it's important to, you know, no, I'm not an orthopedic surgeon, Jen's uh, not an orthopedic surgeon, so um, we, we're, we can't speak for them, but there are definitely many different procedures. Um, the more common ones are um, uh, tendon lengthening, uh, procedures or hip surgeries. Um, the most important thing to note, uh, or for, for hip surgeries, I, I think it's important to say that oftentimes you hear, you get the diagnosis that your um, loved one or child's hips are subluxed, and, and that could be pretty disconcerting. Um, however, a, a, a sublux hip isn't necessarily something that you have to treat. Or, or surgically, pain is an important factor. So painful hips are something that are, um, are important to discuss um, with your uh, multidisciplinary team. Um, with big surgeries like a hip reconstruction surgery that they may use to treat a sublux hip um, needs to be uh, thought out well. It should be combined with a, a, a intensive rehab program afterwards because the procedure itself and, and the rest and the, the time away from moving uh, after the procedure could also um, result in some setbacks in, in, in function. Tenotomies or tendon lengthening surgeries are commonly done with other procedures and we'll talk about them in the upcoming slides. So this next slide, please. So serial casting is one of them. Serial casting is simply using um, the same cast that they would put on a broken limb um, nowadays, they're fiberglass, so they're very lightweight, um, and they leave it on for an extended period of time to provide a prolonged stretch to regain some uh, flexibility or to lengthen the soft, soft tissue that's causing the uh, contracture. Um, it's typically done across one joint, so either your ankle or your knee or your elbow, um, and it takes about six weeks. It's 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 a uh, uh, a commitment on the family's part um, because it requires multiple visits to a specialized center who's familiar with serial casting because they remove the cast at least once a week um, to uh, check your range of motion to see if there's been any gains, but also importantly to check your skin underneath the cast because you can't see what's going on under the skin and there could be pressure points and um, uh, more serious consequences for uh, skin breakdown. Um, the, the good thing is, and when on lower extremity serial casting, it's oftentimes you can um, walk. Um, you, sometimes they give the, the individual a boot so that um, if, if the ankle is what's being cast so that they can walk. 
um, and because they're lightweight, it's, it's pretty manageable, but of course it does alter their usual patterns of gait. Um, and again, these are things that can be done or in conjunction, either alone or in conjunction with Botox um, or other treatments like tenotomies. Physical therapy um, is uh, a, a core uh, treatment. I, I'm sure most people would agree. I'm not just saying that because I'm a physical therapist in the management of CAND. Um, physical therapy it, it comes, it, it can be accessed in different ways. It can be school-based. It could be in an outpatient facility or at home um, or a combination of all of these um, services. But overall, the goal is always to maximize function. And in, in, in with that in mind, the, the focus is either on flexibility, on strengthening, on conditioning and function. Um, physical therapists work closely with you, as you probably know, to, to, to augment or to improve mobility. And mobility is different. How you move around in your home is different than how you move around in your community. And, and to do that, um, physical therapists are uh, really helpful at um, determining what assistive devices uh, might help you get around and also assistive technology. So a physical therapist may not be the provider of the assistive technology, but they could be your point person to, to think about what may be helpful and where to go about and get it. Next slide. Um, when we focus on uh, flexibility or, or uh, range of motion, we use range of motion or stretching. And it could be used with devices like orthoses like, uh, or splints. Um, this picture here is highlighting a, what we call a KAFO or knee ankle foot orthosis because it, it encompasses both your knee and your ankle. They're often custom made, so they're well fit um, for your child or loved one, um, and can provide a pr passive prolonged stretch to promote fl uh, flexibility. There are also manual techniques. They could be passive, where you, where another person helps um, stretch your joints and your limbs while while you, the child or the individual remains passive, or the the child could help. Um, with you with the activity. So something that's active assisted and sometimes that's better tolerated um, where you work together to, to get flexibility. And all of these things, a physical therapist could train you and your family to, to do these together. I'd like to point out that standing frames are, are really a great opportunity to both treat flexibility, but actually it treats sublux hips. So um, weight bearing in an upright position is good uh, to um, shape your hips and to get your hips back in your sockets. And so um, uh, in addition to uh, standing, uh, also prom promotes flexibility in your lower extremities and your ankles and your knees. So supportive standing or standers are an option that your physical therapist may recommend. Um, important to note that, that um, uh, standing frames should be used in small bouts. And so um, we usually recommend not using, being in the stander for more than an hour at a time. Um, and thoracic bracing is another um, uh, consideration. Sometimes it's like a, a vest, uh, sometimes they call it to provide support for your trunk in typically in se seated postures. Next slide. <clears throat> Strengthening is an, and also an important um, activity. A lot of us um, and those who have canned have some degree of like uh, disuse weakness. And so you're not moving as much, you're not doing as much with that muscle group. And so there's a potential to, to get stronger and maybe move better. And so strengthening is an important activity and it could should be encouraged and incorporated in um, the, a, a child's daily activity. It has to be fun as well. And it should be done at least two to three times a week. Next slide. Along with strengthening is aerobic exercise. And, you know, aerobic exercise, um, it should be age appropriate and incorporated into everyday life. The American College of Sports Medicine recommends that all individuals 
should exercise it up 30 minutes, five times a week. And, and so this applies to individuals with CAND as well. And this could be done in various modalities, swimming, um, you know, gaming, biking, walking, um, wheelchair sports are great if for those who are not ambulatory. Hippotherapy is another option, although sometimes hard to access in different communities. Um, hippotherapy is, is using horses or horseback riding. Um, and that not only is, um, a, uh, can be aerobic activity, but it's a good strengthening um, activity. What's important here, and oftentimes we, we have uh, parents or family members ask us, you know, how do we know it, we're not doing too much or we're not pushing our, our loved ones too hard? And, you know, the good thing is, um, kids are good at telling us and when when they're too tired or we're they're doing too much. And so listen to your child and you know your child and you know when enough is enough. And you also know when it's it's maybe you're, you're, it's okay to push. And so just I, I think your usual practices and how you engage your with your your family member and, and know them, listen to them and 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 you'll be able to adjust their um, activity accordingly. Next slide. So we're gonna finish up here with um, a couple of misconceptions um, <clears throat> slash take home points um, from both of our, our point of view. Um, it's important to recognize that medications don't have the same response in all patients. Every patient is different. Um, and it very often does involve trial and error. And you really need to work together to, to uh, with your doctor or clinical providing team. Um, you know your body better than anyone. And so even if the doctor um, says, I think this medication should do this, you need to provide that feedback so they know whether or not that medicine is doing what it should or should not be doing. Um, please be uh, your, your best advocate and your family member's best advocate when it comes to medication um, and medication response. Medication does not mean more benefit. So just because you're on more medication does not mean you're necessarily always going to do better. Um, so please just be aware that it always is helpful to think about the lowest dose and, and potentially that could be just enough. One medication at a higher dose is better than two medications together. Not necessarily true. Um, there are certainly side effects from every medication. And so sometimes it is better to be on a little bit of one and a little bit of another. Um, sometimes it is better to be on one. And so I think, again, having that collaborative approach with your provider is going to be really most important. Um, most of the medications that we discuss are targeting different chemicals in different areas of the brain. And so um, sometimes it is a matter of finding the right combination to really address more than one concern at a time. I think we all know this, but we have to say it. Um, one pill or one surgery will not fix everything here. And so we have to be mindful that um, every decision we make um, has the potential to help with something, um, but it certainly wouldn't fix everything. And I think importantly, back to the very beginning, there's not just one doctor that's going to be able to manage it all. Um, you also won't have that expert canned uh, multidisciplinary team. Um, but you do have doctors that you can find that, that know you, that know your body, that you work well with, um, and, and see if you can find a doctor or a team that works well together. Collaboration is really important here. Um, you do really want to balance out the different opinions of, of your parents, of your families, of your providers, researchers. Um, um, the internet can be very helpful, but it also should just be considered a, a discussion point um, to say, well, what about maybe dystonia? What about spasticity? Um, it's okay to ask questions um, and, and have that mindful discussion with your provider. The reality is that we don't know the right decision for CAND and we don't know the right decision for your child. Um, we do know that being here today and being a part of the natural history study hopefully will be more telling to, to really giving us more information about spasticity and other movement disorders um, implicated in CAND. And we really hope to continue to work together um, to really better understand what's going on and, and to help as many people as possible. We appreciate your time today, and we hope that this was helpful and contributory to your understanding of spasticity and management um, in camp.